Hello, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, a joint meeting of the Hong Kong Study Circle and Hong Kong Philatelic Society, uh, sponsored by the Federation of Inter-Asia Philately. Uh, I'm so glad to see uh, so many of you uh, 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 coming here uh, to share with us your treasures. And um, I think uh, without further ado, I would like to uh, invent uh, Ingo uh, to give a short presentation of the very successful CAPEX uh, uh, one, well, one Frame uh, exhibition just concluded recently. Yes, um, all yours, Ingo. I'm going to stop sharing now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Andrew, and um, thank you, everybody, for uh, putting up with a few slides about uh, a very, very special show. It was the first of its kind as, a, as an international show dedicated solely to one-frame exhibits. Uh, we started the process in 2019. Sam Chu and myself uh, were on the organizing committee pretty well from the beginning. And uh, after three years of work with especially the last six months being intense hard work, uh, we had a wonderful show, well attended. Um, we had FIP recognition. It wasn't a full-fledged FIP uh, uh, sponsored show, but we had FIP recognition. Uh, Bernie Beston was going to be the uh, honorary president of the jury. And in the last minute, he had an unfortunate uh, incident and needed an emergency eye operation and couldn't come. But uh, we had quite a, a good FIP presence there. Um, we targeted 400 exhibits. In the end, we were oversubscribed and had to reject some. But when the exhibits went up, there, of course, with all shows, a few didn't show up. Uh, unfortunately, the Peru commissioner ended up getting COVID and she, she didn't bring six of the exhibits she was bringing. So the total number that were up in the show was something like in the 390s. Uh, but we're proud of that because when we started talking about it, there was a lot of naysayers. People said, you'll never get 400 one frame exhibits into one show. And uh, we did it and we're proud of it. We also had a wonderful uh, literature section. There was about 130 exhibits. Uh, Michelle Hood was the uh, administrator of that and did a wonderful job. And uh, we even had some interesting stories uh, to go along with the literature exhibits. So for example, uh, the Ukrainians, we, we have a big Ukrainian population in Toronto and they have a pretty significant stamp and coin club. And they ended up uh, smuggling a few books out of Ukraine after the war start to get uh, them into Capex. So that was a it was, a, it was a good publicity thing for us, but it was also a wonderful thing to have some, some guys who are out there fighting for their lives to have representation at a show like this. Um, in terms of the exhibits, there was 32 countries represented, uh, Albania to Uruguay. Um, the bulk of it was Canadian and US uh, and about I want to say 100, 150 were from uh, from other countries. Uh, very good presence of Latin America and um, also the subcontinent. We had Pakistan, India, and um, Middle East. We had Qatari exhibits and Iran. Uh, so there was there was a very good variety of of countries and exhibits and extreme fantastic quality. Um, dealers, there was a big bourse, there was about 68 dealers from all points in the world. You know, the, all the usual suspects, Gibbons, Spink, Siegel, um, Gertner, they were all there. And uh, of course, a lot of smaller guys where you could just go and look at covers in their boxes. And it was such a wonderful thing after COVID to be looking through boxes of covers. Um, and we had a very big seminar program. That was my personal responsibility amongst others. And uh, we ended up getting about 28 societies and some of them gave multiple seminars. So we ended up having 65 seminars in those four days. It was hard to get everything in in such a compressed show. 
so we just uh, had to pick and choose what we were going to do, but we had some wonderful seminars. Um, so the Hong Kong presence at CAPEX 22 was quite significant. Michelle Hood was an exhibitor. He was the administrator of the literature exhibits, and he was also the convener and a, a presenter in the Hong Kong Study Circle meeting. That was one of the societies that attended as a group. And uh, Michelle did some yeoman's work to, to definitely with the literature, uh, gathering it all at the Green Foundation where we had people send it in um, and then get, moving it over to the show site and then spending the whole show at the literature table, similar to what was in London 2022, where we had a, where they had a, a literature and reading room kind of set up. Sam Chu, of course, was a juror. Um, he was one of the presenters at our meeting. Uh, he was a major factor on the CAPEX 22 organizing committee. And as we already noted, he became president-elect of the Royal Philatelic Society of Canada. And I, I agree, it's a very, very significant and wonderful thing that a Chinese guy is the president of a royal society. I, 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 we, in Canada, we have a lot of diversity and we believe in mutual accommodation. And to have Sam Chu as president, it just warmed my heart. John Wilson was a, a juror. He wasn't an official. Study circle meeting. I exhibited and I was very much involved with the organizing committee. I had multiple tasks and uh, spent the last six months completely dedicated to the show. There was about six of us in the organizing committee who just gave up our lives for that show. And it, it was very gratifying to get the fantastic feedback that we did. I, I would say about 99 0.9% of the feedback we got was very warm and very positive. Uh, and Ian Gibson Smith was there as an exhibitor. He got a nice gold uh, for uh, something. I'll show you the uh, details in another slide. And of course, he's a bon vivant. Wherever you go with Ian, you're going to have a lot of fun and a lot of craziness. And we enjoyed uh, his company. Um, yeah, so these were the presentations. Um, Sam Chu talked about his sea force, which he's presented in this forum. Sorry, uh, Michelle, Ingo, I, sorry, Ingo, are you showing slides? Yeah, are you not seeing my slides? I have no slides. Is everybody seeing my slides? No, no. just hearing you. What? Nobody's seeing my slides. Oh, have you done share screen? I was on share screen, I thought. Oh, well, thanks for telling me that. Let me try again. I'm so sorry. Where is it? I thought you did give us a talk. About <laughs> yeah, no, it's supposed to be. Oh, you've got, something, you've got some presentation as well, right? Yeah, yeah, this is a PowerPoint. Yeah, all right. <laughs> okay, share. Oh, all right, okay, here right. we go. All oh, right, 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 right. Okay, I'll just quickly go through the first few that we've already covered. Yeah, so this was the uh, first slide, and then I talked about uh, the Hong Kong presence. And these were the presentations. Uh, Sam Chu talked about the Sea Force, which he's presented in this uh, forum, and Michelle on his. Uh, Hong Kong and the British Post Office at Bangkok. So it's based on Michelle's book on, on Bangkok and the British consular office there, but slanted to Hong Kong, of which there's a significant amount of uh, postal history and in interaction, and it was a wonderful talk. And then John Wilson gave his talk. He called it the long march to full postal delivery in Hong Kong. I like his use of that, that uh, clever statement about the long march but he's what he's really talking about is uh, the postman's beat chops and the walks that the post the as hong kong grew and and started to have local delivery and 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 so on the development throughout history 
which is not documented and is not um, written up in post office uh, circulars and documents and government documents that can be found. And he's he's reconstructing the regulations through cover evidence. It was a very, very fascinating talk. And he's been working on that for many years. So it was good to finally get some public uh, public uh, recognition of what what he's the research he's been doing. Um, we got a few people who came that promised they want to come to our B62 meeting. So we might be, get, be getting a few new members in the Hong Kong study circle. Um, so exhibit results from members of the uh, Hong Kong study circle. Michel got a 92 for his uh, British consulate, consular post office at Bangkok. Uh, fantastic result. I, I think it's well deserved. And uh, Ian got his uh, 90 points for his uh, China uh, postal stationery registered envelopes, the China re overprinted registered envelopes. He had some material material in there that just made my mouth water. It was incredible. And uh, I had my uh, Hong Kong 1945 exhibit up. I got a large ver May 85 points. I'm happy with that. I actually plan to redesign that exhibit. I got a very good critique from Charles Verge uh, about six months ago, but unfortunately, I had zero time to work on it to change it. So it was the same old, same old as was in London. But I'm happy with the 85. And once I do all the stuff that Charles taught me, I'm hoping to bump that up a little bit. You see the medal up there that was given out to all the uh, exhibitors. Um, so one uh, fantastic item that was at the show, it was not on display, it was with the dealer. Doreen Royan of South Africa has the famous Hong Kong King George VI uh, strip of three imperforates of the eighth cent. Um, to me, that's a dream item. You talked about mortgaging your house, uh, Andrew. Uh, this thing has a, it says price on request. It, the price is 250,000 pounds. So uh, I have a paid off house, but I think my wife would object if I'd get a mortgage to buy that, to buy that thing. So they allowed me to take pictures of it and, and they were actually really nice. And uh, I jokingly said, okay, give me first right of refusal before you sell that thing. But uh, it was great to hold that in my hands. It's actually the most significant King George VI item, not only of, of Hong Kong, or it's the, it's the most significant or rare item of, of all King George VI uh, reign. There might be one or two other candidates uh, for that title, but I think that is the one. Yeah. And um, it's a really spectacular piece. It's an amazingly good condition, a little bit cut close on the left side uh, at the upper stamp. And there's a little bit of a crease between the lower two stamps. But boy, oh boy, was it ever cool to hold that in my hands. And they <laughs> took a picture of me with it. So uh, something to dream about. Mm. And then the last thing I'm showing is just a recent cover I picked up. After all the Capex talk, I got to show some postal history. And I was able to pick this up. This wasn't from, from Spink. This was from a local dealer here, uh, an auction house. And uh, I'm really happy about this because I, I was picking it up because I'm interested in postage due, as well as uh, obviously Hong Kong postal history. Um, it looks like it's not a contrived cover. A lot of postage due covers are contrived. Um, there's no sender's name on the back. There's nothing on the back. So I can't tell who sent it, but how somebody got a couple of uh, 10 cent revenue stamps and thought they could use them for postage, I don't know. 20 cents was the correct rate, but as you can see, it wasn't recognized. The post office clerk put that blue crayon line around the stamps indicating that they weren't considered valid. And it ended up paying five pence uh, postage due upon arrival. Um, you've got a very nice clear Hong Kong 1932 chop there. 
And that T marking, that's the thing that got me really excited once I looked it up. In Sam Chu's uh, book on um, postage due and also in um, Proud, mm -hmm. that is an unlisted marking. That very thick T is not listed in, in any of those references. So it's a, it's a new marking. So I was very happy. Plus it's a Via Siberia cover. So lots of features on it and I uh, had a lot of fun with that once I got it. So Ingo, that before you is move my on, show. Before you move on, what, what's the purple writing uh, just above the Hong Kong CDS there? 50, 50 something? I think it's, I think it's 5D, meaning five pence. Uh, Gotcha. And gotcha. I don't know what the word is there, but uh, yeah, that is uh, that somebody calculated, you know, the uh, exchange and, and all that of what it should be. It's it also interesting centimes. under 50 centimes that, yeah, that makes sense. Under Siberia, you can see that uh, maybe somebody used a, a pin to attach something and there's something written in pencil with ounce, eight ounce or something. No, one ounce. About it would be ounce. one ounce. One yeah. Ounce. Neat cover. Yeah. Yeah. And that little A in the bottom uh, right edge, I don't know what that is either. That is a bit of a mystery. I, I wouldn't know where that was put on or, you know, who put that on. But uh, anyways, it's a, it's a fun little cover. So that is my show and tell. Mm, thank you very much. Yeah. Nice item. Engo, Engo, um, yeah, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, can, can you go back to, to the page uh, with the strip of three of the uh, Kindros 6 uh, extents? Yep. I thought you guys would want to see that more. <laughs> Just give me a second here. Do you see it? Do you see the screen share? At the end of slideshow, <laughs> maybe you need to go, go back a, a few pages. I'm going to start over again. Just slide down. I don't know why it's so slow today. Come on, load. <laughs> now let me go to the actual slide. Yeah, 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 right. yeah. Okay. okay. Um, there. At, at, at the at bottom of the description, um, there is a paragraph, original letter from Salus of Hong Kong Canton and Macau Steamboat Letters, a limited dated 7th July, 1955. What, what is it about? Do you have an idea? Oh, very good question, Simon. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. That letter, I took a photo of it. I, I didn't show it here for display. It is Mr. Deleuze uh, thanking Sir Percival, uh, Sir David for um, purchasing that item from him and telling him that he wasn't willing to lower the price to 75 pounds as requested. <laughs> Uh -huh. okay. so he paid more he paid more than 75 pounds i can only imagine maybe it was a hundred or something but yeah it's a very interesting letter it's on uh, uh hong kong and macau steamship company letterhead i mm -hmm. should have shown the 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 image if you want i can i can yeah yeah please, please send a copy to me. i'm very interested uh, in, in all those uh correspondence or or, or uh, any information relating to mr Dallas. Yeah, actually, you know what? I'm sorry I didn't think of putting it on here. It's a poor quality because it was a, it's a sort of light colored uh, letter, like with a sort of yellowish background. It's But they let me open it and look at it, and I right away took a photo. And it is a very, it's it's almost, you know, it, it makes that that item more significant because it's, it's provenance. Mm. Okay, yeah. Thank so you. so the strip actually came from Dalus. So he, he must have bought it from somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. That's interesting. Mm. Mm. 
Okay, thank how, you. How, no, many, uh, how many of these exist? If it was a sheet, it, it says somewhere it was a sheet there's of in There's a pair. There's a pair. And the, there's, a, there's a strip of three and a pair, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Those were the only ones who survived. Yeah. Everything else went on letters to China. Mm. And in 19, you know, 40s, late 40s, that that would have never been saved or, or kept, you know. I mean, I would love to go somewhere in the in the regions of South China and try to dig through old grandmother's correspondences to find one of these babies on cover, but I'm sure that's been done and I'm sure there's there's none that survived. Do, do, right. do you think it is very expensive uh, or just very cheap uh, in the year of 1955? Sorry, I didn't understand you. Oh, okay. Um, 75 pounds. Do you think it's expensive or cheap in 1955 when, yeah. when, the first, when they first changed hands? Um, I, I think that was, would have been a bargain. It would have been a bargain at, at you know, at any price at, in that era, I mean, it, it was a lot of money, 75 or so, let's say he paid a hundred or 90 or something. That would have been a fair price, but I, I'd have to look up an old catalog to see what the um, pricing was in the catalogs at that time. Maybe that one wouldn't have been listed yet, mm -hmm. but definitely, um, you know, to compare it with the 96 cent uh, all of Bister Mint or, or whatever it was in the catalog at that time to see some of the high high end items and have some relation to what what the price would be. But I mean, con in considering what it's being sold for now, that was a hell of a bargain. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Ingo. Okay, thank you. Right. Okay. Okay, good. Um, okay, so... Uh, uh, just, just before we go on, please, uh, I went on Google, uh, the stuff you find on Google, unbelievable. So I typed in, what is 75 pounds in 1955 worth today? And it says 2,795 pounds. No, oh, still a bargain. Mm, yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> still a bargain. Right, thank you. So, uh, uh, just Sam just has a as, question. Ah. Ju uh, Ingo, just as an explanation, this is an FIP specialized, uh, and because of that, they we have the rights that the show has the rights to appoint forty percent Canadian judges that are not FIP qualified, and sixty percent would be FIP um, judges. So we have several who were just national level judges, including John Wilson. Okay, got so it. That was okay. Yeah, that was okay. Yeah. In, in 1955, I was earning between six to seven pounds a week in London. Ah. So. So with a week's salary, you could almost have that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> 10 weeks salary. 10 weeks later. Right. Okay. So uh, thank you, Ingo, for your presentation. Uh, yes, uh, I hope that you're going to have uh, another exhibition in a uh, fairly short time, within my lifetime, hopefully. <laughs> well, within your lifetime, I would say yes. But one thing <laughs> we've, we learned from that, and Sam and Michelle will agree, now we know why internationals are only once every 10 years. <laughs> no, last time was 26 years ago. Yeah. Um, I attended. Yeah. I, was the, I was the Hong Kong commissioner. At, at I remember. At the that's, 96. Yeah, that's where we <laughs> and first I met. I can't afford to wait another 20 years for the next one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be in a wheelchair. <laughs> Anyhow, so thank you very much. Uh, and uh, as I say, I wish I were there, but uh, unfortunately, you know, because of the obviously various events, I couldn't be. So uh, anyhow, um, I, I think um, uh, uh, Professor Shaw has a few things to say about uh, our uh, the, the, the Hong Kong Philatelic Society's uh, latest journal. I just want to say, Professor, you want to say a few words? Okay, sure. Should I? I would like to share the screen. Yeah.
So do you see this? Uh, do, you, do you see the uh, picture? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So uh, this is uh, just out uh, in May this year. And uh, so is the number 26 volumes. Uh, so you can see this design. And uh, this is, in fact, uh, the devotion to thank the frontline uh, medical and supporting staff okay, who have uh, worked quite timelessness uh, during this uh, pandemic period. So uh, Hong Kong and the rest uh, of the world has been uh, uh, caught, in, caught the COVID uh, for more than two years. So uh, we are quite stuck. So uh, this is the uh, cover design. So uh, this year we got uh, quite a number of uh, contributions. In fact, uh, we have six, 18 uh, different articles. We are divided into two parts. One is on Hong Kong and mainland China, and another is international. Okay. And uh, so in fact, I would like to thank our co-editor, uh, Andrew, Andrew Zhang, who has a, a legal eyes to uh, clear all those uh, errors in the uh, articles. And so, uh, beside these uh, well-written articles, we have also some general uh, things. I would highlight some of them, including these uh, our society activities. Uh, so we got the AGM, and uh, this is the Zoom meeting organized by Angel uh, for the past uh, twelve months. So in fact, we got uh, this QR code, and then. Uh, uh, if you do not want to type in the long uh, YouTube link, then you can use this QR code. So uh, this uh, sort of different meeting will help for the past 12 months. Okay. Let's uh, get some pictures. And then uh, in the uh, later half of last year, we got uh, some fiscal meeting. So, uh, but unfortunately, uh, after December, and then uh, it was terminated again, uh, just resumed uh, this month. So we got uh, some activities, some physical activities. So there's a record. Uh, this is the uh, Zoom meetings. So we have some physical meetings. And uh, we are quite pleased. In fact, uh, the uh, journal, uh, not this one, but the number 24 issues, got some awards. Uh, including these uh, Go Awards uh, from the uh, New Zealand, uh, the Philatelic Literature Exhibitions, and also uh, uh, award the best periodical. So we are quite pleased. We also got uh, uh, last or May uh, award in the Japan uh, exhibition. And then I would like to highlight a few uh, interesting or heavy weight articles uh, out of that 18 articles. So the first one uh, is this uh, Mr. Francis Al has an article to show the examples of the mail uh, through the British Postal History Service of the 1844 to uh, 1900. So it's an early period. And uh, besides showing the different covers, he also saw some of the different S1, uh, different types of S1s on covers and also on stamps. So uh, I'm not going to show all the, the whole articles. And uh, in fact, if you are interested, you can send me an email or send Andrew an email. We would uh, put it on Dropbox and then you can download it yourself. <laughs> the mail is exceedingly slow nowadays. By search surface mail, maybe you get it after half a year. Another is uh, Chao Chen. <laughs> uh, he talked about this, uh, uh, some mis mysterious cancellations. So stamp already canceled by a uh, departing PO will be recanceled again by the same port or uh, another port. But, uh, there are many recancellations are of unknown nations. And uh, Charles talked about these different uh, interesting recancellations. 
Another is uh, by Andrew. Uh, he talked about this interesting uh, machines. Uh, these are banking machines called the Taiwan machine. Uh, invented by the French engineer and also used in the Shanghai French post office. Another one is by uh, Sam Xu. Uh, Sam Xu talked about the uh, correspondence between uh, himself, uh, uh, between the lock up. Lock up is quite famous. He got a lock up role in Hong Kong, uh, between uh, lock up and his daughter, uh, Mary Lock up. Okay. And uh, lock up is the, uh, the registrar general so in the early days, and he surveyed the entire new territories uh, uh, before the over by the colonial office uh, in 1899. Okay. So it's quite a long article. Another is Simon. Uh, Simon has a part two of the work uh, on its continuations of the series dealing with the Hong Kong official pay day stamps. And uh, the article have uh, several uh, sessions, including a brief introduction of stamp cancelling machines, and also type of this official pay machine CPS in CPO shopping office, and also this uh, official pay machine CPS in Calvin shopping office. So this is uh, interesting articles. And then uh, we got Dennis Chow. Uh, Dennis Chow talk about the uh, uh, the Italian post office in China. Uh, in uh, Italy, in fact, uh, open two ministry post office one in Peking and another in Tianjin. Okay. And then uh, until 1917, uh, Italy officially made uh, the use of the ordinary postal deal and express stamps for, of Italy uh, in China by overprinting Tianjin and uh, Pichin. Okay. And then the, from 1917 till 1921, uh, uh, they print all together 16 sets of stamps, uh, except they are identical. X sets are for uh, Tenshin and X sets are for uh, Peking. So, uh, uh, uh then let's uh, talk about these uh, X sets of the different uh, sets uh, of the different stamps. Okay, another is by Richard. Uh, Richard talk about the uh, uh, changes in the administration of postal matters at Mark, Macau and Hong Kong. At the very early period, 1840 to 1842, and the only uh, dealt with the civilian postal establishment. Okay. Another one is by uh, Leon Lee. Uh, Leon Lee talked about the uh, uh, marine maritime mail of the Ecuador uh, within the colonial period. Okay, so counting of five chapters, one is the maritime mails from Spain to Ecuador. Another is very good, maritime mails from Ecuador to Spain. Another is Spanish Pacific Coast mail. The fourth one is maritime mail for the Ecuador and the fifth is the appendix. So it's quite a good reference uh, for collectors of these uh, uh, Ecuador. And yeah. Okay, so these are the, some of the uh, postal histories uh and uh, matters and uh, also uh maybe some uh, traditional uh, uh, uh classified as traditional uh, uh, uh stems uh, categories uh, uh, so besides that we got some interesting uh, uh, thematic uh, topics so what is by jenny uh, jenny Benfield of new zealand uh, he, she got a very interesting uh, picture, picture postcard exhibit of the anthro, uh, anthro, anthropomorphic cats. Uh, so this exhibit is followed uh, the, uh, what the cats do as a human, okay? uh, from birth to uh, becomes a grand uh, parent. Uh, uh, this is uh, the Janice cat. So it's quite uh, interesting when you get cat love, uh, I would recommend you uh, to take, take a look at this article. It's an 
uh, some uh, uh, the, the extract from the uh, exhibitions. Uh, we got quite a lot of uh, these uh, different sheets. Uh, we got um, uh, let's say check out the more interesting uh, sheets. So the uh, for this issue, I think this is also important uh, because we are in the uh, middle of the COVID nineteen. Uh, so we think we should have an article on COVID nineteen. So. Uh, when we look back uh, several years, uh, at least uh, we have got something to like mark on this topic. Okay? So uh, I myself uh, take the warranty, uh, uh, and if this is my co author. My, in fact, it is, it is my uh, students, PhD students. Uh, but he can now graduate, and he uh, now got a job in Cambridge, UK. Very interesting. Uh, he becomes a scientist in Cambridge. And uh, so we uh, wrote these uh, articles on uh, COVID-19. So we uh, introduced some interesting uh, remarkable stamps and also we have materials about COVID-19. So I think that uh, it would be useful uh, for reference of these particular topics. So this is what I would like to uh, say and I hope that uh, if you're interested, uh, as I said, send me an email or send Android email. Okay? It was or why you link for download this journal. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, PC. Uh, you, you, you will get your journal in due course <laughs> by service mail. It probably takes about two to three months. Uh, uh, and, uh, but if you're dying to read it, you can either send, uh, 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 give a, send an email to PC or, or myself, and I, I can actually send you the file by whatever Dropbox or, or sense, uh, sense space or um, anyway. Uh, so you get a hard copy in due course. Uh, yeah. Anyway, thank I'd you like very to much. mention that uh, I'd like to mention that I, I did somehow get sent uh, a copy by um, by Internet of this wonderful magazine. Congratulations. The the thing besides the fantastic content is yeah. simply beautiful. It's a work of art. So congratulations yeah. on that. Yeah. And uh, I, I also uh, sent a copy of the COVID uh, yeah. article to someone here in Canada you might have heard of, Gene Wang, yeah. who's uh, Dr. Gene Wang, yeah. who's very much into uh, collecting everything that has to do with COVID and uh, awesome. doing extremely well exhibiting. So thank you very, very much. Yeah. Has he got an actual exhibit? On COVID, she, I don't think she has uh, a, a, an exhibit. Uh, her area is, uh, is a study of blood, uh, okay. but she's shown, uh, she's shown various uh, uh, talks and that sort of thing. I don't see. think, Ingo, do you know, uh, does Jean have a, an actual exhibit on COVID that uh, would be a one-framer or multi-framer? I don't know about exhibits. I think she's given talks. Okay. She's done some presentations yeah. uh, illustrated with some fabulous covers, but I, I don't think she's done an actual exhibit. I might be wrong. Sam, maybe you know. With the amount of new material coming out, it's not a one frame exhibit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so, so when you send something like that out to members, you never know how far it goes out and what tentacles uh, draw things in. So thank you very much. Thank you. Right. All right. Uh, thank you, PC. Uh, right. I can see uh, uh, Susan and Duncan has been have been waiting impatiently for their turn <laughs> to present uh, some wonderful items. So uh, I should hand over to you, you two. Right. Uh, I'm showing some scalp floors from the George V definitives, and they're on the second set. I chose these because they are floors that weren't illustrated by Nick and David Anshow. I presume at the time they made book, there weren't any examples to photocopy. So I thought people might be interested in seeing them. There are two listed 
There's the Web 39, HAG 51, which is at the, on the top row of the Northwest pane, number five. And it's described as a two millimeter cut on the scalp above the head, horizontal. Web state that occurs on four values, the one cent, two cent, four cent, and 10 cent, and suggests that it was on requisition C star, which is 1931-32. The second one, web 43, hag 53, is on the same pane, lower down, row eight, number six. And it has a similar description, two millimeter cut on scalp from above head down towards the left. And Webb suggests that it might be on all of the requisitions. When I first saw this one, it was on a single. And I assumed it was the second of the two floors because it slopes down to the left. And then I saw it on this pair. And this is obviously row one, number five, which makes it the first of those two floors. So it's not exactly horizontal, it does slope down to the left. As I mentioned, Webb says on the one, two, four, and 10 cents, but it does occur on the eight cents as well. Here is the example. There were two definite orange printings, Requisition O, 1922, Requisition A, 1930. Volume one suggests there was Requisition Q, 1937. But as I understand it, the Crown Agents and Delarue don't mention this. So if we try and work out the requisition, 1922, the requisition O, you've got the one, four, eight, and 10 cents, but there was no two cents included. The other eight cents printing, there was a one, four, eight, and 10 cents, but again, no two cents green printing. Webb suggested requisition C star. Well, that was a 10 cents, but no two cents. And if we go to the one that's not recorded, again, we don't have all of the five values. So it would suggest that this flow occurred on more than one requisition, but which ones? is not certain. And just to prove it is on the two cents green, there's an example of it there. The second one can be seen on the top stamp there is on a China overprint. That slopes down to the left too, but it's much sharper angle and a somewhat narrower scratch. And um, that is requisition F, which was 1922. I haven't come across any other examples. I don't know whether anybody else has, whether it occurs on any other values or any other printings. This is the one where Webb said it, it was re records it as all question mark. Finally, this is a third scalp floor that's not listed. Whether it's constant or not, I don't know. But it's a small foot one that slopes down to the right. If anyone else has an example and um, can prove it's constant or tell me what location it is on the sheet, I'd be pleased to hear from them. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, any comments from the members? What do you think caused those flaws? Well, I presume it's just a scratch. At some point, somebody's been a bit careless with the plates and scratches have occurred. I mean, they were used for printing all the different values. So they did get a lot of wear. Mm. 
it's funny that it's always on the king's scalp and and there nowhere are, else there are lots of others there are lots of others as well that i can show if you're interested <laughs> next time <laughs> oh i got it <laughs> right right good uh i'll keep a lookout for them <laughs> thank you susan uh duncan you've got a few things to show right Right, I, I brought you a short display of Hong Kong airmails sent from June to October 1940 when Italy's entry into the war meant that the normal route through the Mediterranean had to be abandoned and instead mail was sent south from Egypt to Durban in South Africa and then forwarded by sea. And I, at the end of this, I just show the alternatives to using that. The last flight from Hong Kong where mail got all the way to England by the normal BOAC routing left on the 2nd of June. It connected at Bangkok with SW245, which is BOAC's code for Sydney westbound. And it reached Poole on the 9th of June. Poole had replaced Southampton as the base because it wasn't bombed as much as Southampton was and these two covers were both on that last dispatch out of Hong Kong $1.15 wartime surcharge rate with an extra 25 cent on the registered cover this cover left the call in on the 5th of June by the time it reached Alexandria on the 10th of June Italy had made it so hostile intentions clear and the service was terminated but this is an enormous puzzle I've had it for years I've shown it to many airmail experts and the problem is it has an 18th of June arrival cancel from Dorridge in the uh, Midlands in Warwickshire and how it got from Alexandria where it was offloaded on the 10th of June to Dorridge by the 18th of June I cannot explain it's certainly not long enough for a sea transit through the Mediterranean. There's no way it went all the way south to Durban. The only possibility it's been suggested is it was carried on a military flight to the UK and arrived by that means. This next cover, or both covers actually, only got as far as Karachi by air. They were offloaded there and sent on by sea from Karachi. Uh, fortunately, the Quinn correspondence, which I have quite a lot of, was often redirected on arrival. So I know the bottom cover had reached London by the 9th of August when it was back stamped on redirection. The 12th of June 1, this terminated at Alexandria. The interesting thing about this cover is that the bike stamp on redirection is the 24th of July, and that's actually when the first horseshoe mail reached Hong Kong. So it suggests this was held in Alexandria, then flown south to Durban and sent on by sea from there. This is the first horseshoe dispatch from Hong Kong, it left the colony on the 23rd of June. Uh, connected at Bangkok and was flown down to Durban and then sent on by sea, arriving 24th of July. Covered by the second dispatch, arrived on the 31st of July, again by sea from Durban. The uh, Vichy authorities started to be very awkward and in early July, Hong Kong host, well, Imperial Airways canceled its flight to Bangkok and the Hong Kong post office made one dispatch on the 6th of July to Rangoon via the CNAC service. Uh, and that's the cover at the uh, top there. The Vichy authorities held talks with the Hong Kong authorities and the service was resumed. And this cover was flown on the 21st of July to Bangkok and then followed the usual routine via 
Durban. Mid-September, more problems. Three successive services were cancelled, but by mid-September, they restarted and the cover at the top left was carried on the 18th of September. It avoided the disruption mentioned above, but it uh, was delayed by mechanical problems to the aircraft at Calcutta. There were further delays, but it restarted again in October. But this time the routing to Bangkok was changed so the mail was flown via terrain. Uh, more delays, this time mechanical problems in Mozambique, but again it had reached London by the 8th of November. The last cover to be flown on the feeder service left Hong Kong on the 15th of October, perhaps fittingly on board Dorado, as Dorado had originated the service in 1936, but attempts to negotiate a new agreement with the Vichy authorities in Indochina proved impossible. The demands they were making that all flights had to be individually cleared in advance was totally impractical for a commercial service. And therefore, after the 15th of October, there were no further feed service flights. I included the photograph of Dorado just to show the lengths they went to to try and persuade the Japanese Army and Navy Air Forces that this was a British aircraft with a Union Jack on the upper plane and on the tail plane, because they did seem to have some problems uh, recognizing British aircraft. Uh, they had, of course, forced down Dardanus over Waichau in 1939. With the feeder service suspended, there were two options now to send mail westwards. One was to send it by sea to Singapore, and join the trunk route there, which is what happened to the top cover at the rate of $1.15. But from the 25th of October, you could also send it via the CNA service to Chung, via Chungking to Rangoon. In both cases, it becomes impossible to uh, trace the actual aircraft and flights because the information was not published. Uh, the Japanese regarded all CNAC aircraft as legitimate war targets, so they were very uh, security conscious. The best way of telling the difference if they're not endorsed is that the CNAC service charge $1.50 for half ounce, not $1.15. Finally, if you chose not to use the horseshoe route, you had three alternatives. You could pay $5 and your mail would be flown across the Pacific by Pan American Airways, across USA to New York, and then by Pan American Airways to Lisbon. And most of the time it was then flown from Lisbon to the UK by BOAC. It was actually KLM aircraft and crews who'd escaped of Holland when the Germans occupied it that operated the uh, service from Lisbon. The second alternative was to send your cover by air across the Pacific, which cost you the $2.80 fee and then a 15 cent surface fee to send it by sea across the Atlantic to the UK. And the third one was the cheapest of the, the two cent, uh, two dollars per half ounce. You could send your mail by sea to the USA, it would then be flown, hopefully, as far as London via Lisbon. So that is the uh, end of my short presentation. Thank you, Dante. Thank you. Excellent. Um, any questions from anybody? No. Nope. <laughs> huh? Silence, everybody. <laughs> do you, uh, Duncan, um, do you actually find some yeah. sort of very heavy sort of uh, the multiple uh, uh, airmail, multiple rates airmail covers going through these uh, special routes? You know, like ten dollar, twenty dollars. Yeah, I, 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 they exist. I, I, I got a triple wad across at the five dollar rate with Frank with the yeah. ten and the five dollar. Uh, I think Nick had some fairly large covers in his uh, Hong Kong airmail collection, his exhibit as well. But 
they do crop up, but at uh, eye-watering common. prices. <laughs> not common, eh? You know, not, with the, the not common, no. Reason. I mean, it's, it's a lot of money, isn't it? Yeah, 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 it is, it is. I mean, even $5, a lot of money in those days, yeah. right? Mm, good. Yeah. Great, great. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure we want to move on to uh, the next presenter. I mean, Harman uh, is uh, you know, dying to, uh, to show us something. <laughs> no, he, he said that I wrote him into to showing, but uh, you know, Harman's got so much stuff you know, you know, hidden everywhere that uh, you know, he, he could be the presenters for the next year, every month. <laughs> right, would you like to un unmute, unmute yourself, Harman? Sure, I'm trying to get these. Uh, do I click the PowerPoint or the, the, the uh, share yeah. first? Yeah, you, you press share, the green button. The right. The button with the arrow. All right. All right. Help me here. How do I show the PowerPoint? Uh, not yet. Have you there it is. Seeing your face. Can you see that? Uh, not quite. <sighs> Well, actually, you I have, have a PowerPoint, but you can't see it. Yeah. You have to first uh, click on share screen. All right. I did that. Yeah. Share screen. I've got a screen with all sorts of windows on it. And then you click on to your PowerPoint. Yeah, that's it. You can see it. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I'm getting so technological here. <laughs> there okay. you go. Uh, well, my, my daughter okay, had uh, indicated to me that uh, all she ever hears me doing is asking people for help. So uh, this time I've got some things on there that I've dug up from my collection that have been binders that I had forgotten I had or were in a binder marked uh, to do some more research. And I finally found the time to do some of the research and figure out what some of this stuff is, especially thankfully to her, her assistants. She's a, an archaeologist and she has all sorts of resources available to her. So this was a uh, what appears to be a, an arrival marking I bought uh, off of eBay a few years ago. No telling how many years ago it was, but uh, with her help, she translated the wording. You can see my arrow pointing uh, at, uh, that Vladivostok, which uh, is the eastern terminus of the Trans-Siberian Railroad, and I, I guess it went up to uh, about Vladivostok and and was canceled on arrival before it, it continued on to its destination, which we don't know whether it was Moscow or what it was. But I've, I've got that to show you. Uh, then I've got one here that uh, yeah, I believe it might be Cyrillic, don't really know, but uh, I can't identify what this letter is, nor what this letter is. I, I've got to do a little more research on that. So if anybody has any idea what this is or they've seen it somewhere else, let me know. Uh, uh, got this. Uh, can I suggest? Just Absolutely. something for that one, uh, maybe Makassar, Makassar, which is on the in the celebs uh, as part of the uh, Dutch West Indies, Dutch East Absolutely. Indies. Absolutely, I can research that. Um, so you think that's an actual English letter, not a Cyrillic? No, no, it's definitely not Cyrillic. It's definitely mm -hmm. English. Okay, got it. Looks like What's an M. Mac. Yeah, I know where it is. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. That's why I'm showing this to you. <laughs> uh, uh, this appears to be some Cyrillic. Don't know. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's, it's smudged out. But I found that um, in a circuit book, an APS circuit book. Uh, that appears to be a Cyrillic letter. Yeah. No telling what else. And for those of you who have, uh, haven't seen, uh, this was uh, stuck away in a book that I've had for Gosh knows how many years, I think close to 20 years. Uh, the uh, registered Yamadi and Wansai, uh, the overprints on the Hong Kong level, there's the Y of Yamadi, and there's the handwritten WT of Wansai, in case mm. somebody hadn't seen those. Uh, this has been in my collection now for close to 40 years. Uh, I just figured it out uh, last week uh, that this is a date 1915, and there's a POS postage. San Francisco on there um, seems to be some sort of a rival marking or a you know, commemorative marking of some sort for San Francisco.
uh, <clears throat> I hunted for 40 years to get this uh, marine sorter, uh, the web type 2 uh, D in blue. Uh, I finally got one sometime in uh, 2012 to 2016 uh, through an auction, somebody's major auction. And there's, that's the only blue example that I've got, um, dated uh, 1875. Uh, I've looked over and over again to find this paid hand stamp in an oval. Um, don't know where it came from or what it was, but uh, or what its origin might have been. Any ideas, anybody? No? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, there's an obliterator here that's got some bars pointing upward and then some bars going horizontally. I don't know what country uh, from which that obliterator has uh, originated. Uh, appears to be a CBIAC in the middle, uh, the triangular or diamond shaped one rather. Um, the oval with something in the middle, not sure what that is. I keep looking at it every couple of weeks, <laughs> hoping something would hit, but nothing has as, as of yet. And then I got really excited over this one. Uh, Googled the, the, the different letters and found out this is probably Goldsboro. Uh, it's a little village and civil parish in West Northamptonshire in England. Uh, I couldn't find the population back in the, in the, in the, before around 1900, but in 2001, it only had 882 people in it. So it's probably a very small little village. So that'd be a really good arrival marking for me. And then uh, <clears throat> all the pay, I've been putting an awful lot on uh, uh, eBay lately. And anybody that buys something from me, I, I give them this information. Uh, if they want to see these <laughs> videos of, of the meetings, go to youtube.com. And I gave them the, the connections for uh, the emails for the memberships for the two organizations, uh, also indicating they both have websites. So hopefully, uh, some of the people that I've invited, I invited, I think, over 25 people uh, last night. Uh, I went back and said, oh, guy, I, I need to, I can get to these people through, uh, through eBay and sent them a, uh, a message. And uh, so hopefully, I think we have a couple people that are actually here today uh, and are joining us. Yes. And I would like to thank them for, 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 for joining us and hope they will again in the future. That does it for me. Great. You're the, you are the ambassador of the Hong Kong Study Circle, Carmen. Well, the more, well the, more the merrier. The more <laughs> the merrier. <laughs> okay, right. So um, anybody got anything to show? All right, okay. Uh, before that, uh, I like to round up the evening by showing uh, some a uh, QA and a uh, by members uh, who actually sent me stuff um, over, over, well, I mean, over, over the last month or so. So, uh, Andrew, yes. Andrew, yes. may I, may I uh, do this little promotion? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Right. I'll, I'll stop sharing them. Yeah. Go on. Oh, right. Yes, 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 yes. So the Royal Philatelic Society of Canada yeah. at the show published this book, Let's Talk a Zig Thing. Mm. Dr. David PC have been using, have been writing this column for us. So now it's condensed in a book. So um, we have a printing of 300. And in the four day show, close to 40%, just, it was just released at the show at KPEX. Close to 40% of the books has been sold already. So mm. it's becoming very highly popular. One of the reason why he did it is because he, he's a, he, he used to be in charge of the, our, our judges and exhibiting in the Royal. So he knows everybody who is exhibiting. And just like in the front here and in the back, all his articles and comments are based on real exhibit pages. So it covers everything from aerophilately to thematics to postcards. So, and of course, you know, the, the basic title pages, you know, so if anybody wants, you know, 
maybe if I could send you the link, uh, Andrew, yeah, and sure. you could post that because uh, there's no plan to do a second printing. Yeah. I think whenever this is gone, it'll be gone. Yeah. So, you know, so, so it's highly popular. Yeah, uh, yeah. Very strong, positive, uh, you know, uh, you know, feedback for this because mm. you have to pay to get it, right? So that's a strong support that so many people have bought it. Highly recommend it. How much is it? Yeah. It's 60 Canadian dollars. Okay. Right. So plus postage. Mm. So, you know, if you're... Uh, it is handled by a, our you know Canadian stem and coin uh, company who you know so you could you could uh, I'll send you the link because you could then yeah, pay okay. and okay. then it will be sent. You know. uh, I'm sure that Thank uh, PC will will uh, uh, put it put a few, for, write a few lines in the in the next newsletter. So the other yeah, PC I I will send you some scan of the front and back yeah. and the two content pages so great great very useful yes, uh, with, um, very useful, very useful. Mm. Yeah, in fact i would like to get one <laughs> <laughs> i'll send you the link i'll send you the link thank so you. you anybody could publish yeah yeah okay thank you thanks thank you sam right okay so uh right i think i'll uh, Right. Okay. So uh, yeah, I received some some questions, uh, de uh, demanding answers uh, from us to see. I uh, see whether you can help them. Uh, so here we go. Right. Uh, there are four. There are a few things. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the R in the circle on the adhesive stamps, and the, and the second second theme is the eight cent or twelve cents UPU postage rates. And the, and the third one is a, a 1855 stampless letter to Batavia. And finally, uh, is the hand struck five cent as a cancel on Hong Kong postcard uh, from uh, one of us here. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm sure everybody familiar with the circular R. Uh, it, it can be found in either black or the red. The red is the earlier version. The, the, uh, the red is the re earlier version. Uh, recorded uh, between 1879 to 80, uh, 82, and then it's, it's also it's the same R, uh, maybe with slight differences, but uh, very, very similar uh, type circular R used at, it, uh, at most of the treaty ports. Uh, it is obviously a requirement of the, um, the UPU regulation to have something to mark registered letters. And then you can, um, uh, or I think most, if not all of the uh, registered R, I've actually seen them uh, are stuck on the back of the letter uh, on the front. And if you look at this one, the, the, obviously the stamps are stuck on the back of the letters, and, but still they, they put the uh, circular R on the front. Okay, so um, now uh, aside from uh, <coughs> finding them on letters, which they should be, uh, you can actually find them on stamps. Uh, these are the two examples on the on the on the two cent uh, eighteen ninety one jubilee, uh, quite rare, rare. I think Charles Chan has a has a copy, but it's not so clear. Uh, also on on the jubilee, but uh, exactly why it is on the jubilee, uh, not sure. But you can see actually there's a cover from a member uh, from Swatow uh, with the circular R cancelling a pair of stamps, uh, actually two five cents, which. Uh, which actually made up the registration fee, which is a 10 cent. Um, it's a stationary envelope, the four cent stationary envelope with additional stamps sent to Trier in, in Germany. Oh. Um, so presumably, um, well, that's, that's my theory is that the, uh, the R is actually is, is a re as registration marking. And then of course, all of you would, would know that um, the registration is a fee and it's not actually a postage rate and it's, it's always fixed, uh, which is which is maybe they just uh, some some clerk just say, oh, this is pay, being paid for the registration fee, so they, they use that to cancel the stamps. Not common, but uh, uh, well, I mean, maybe there are more than one cover, but uh, that's one of the members uh, uh, in a member's collection. Now this is very interesting. This actually, this item is an avid reception 
a, a document uh, that was shown in, the, in our Tuesday meeting by a, a member. Uh, he actually, I've, I've never seen this before, uh, 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 this document, and uh, you can see this, uh, that the AR fee uh, was actually five cent, um, and the re registration fee was 10 cents. And then uh, you can see there has a R, R and Co perfume on the five cent, which I believe is Russell and Co uh, from Amoy. This is actually from Amoy. Um, and uh, it is actually, it's a, it's a, a stock folded document. And then you, you can see after unfolded, I'm sorry, this is a picture taken at the meeting. You can see it's bilingual. It's obviously the UPU regulation to have bilingual, uh, English and Chinese. And then this is the dispatch uh, CDS. And uh, this is the address of the letter. So if you happen to find this letter or the discover in your collection, please let me know because I think the owner of this document will be delighted to get hold of your letter. <laughs> and uh, obviously this is, uh, said received this day, a registered letter sent to me by Mr. C. Dos Remedios, uh, who obviously worked for the Russell uh, 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 in, in Amoy. So this is quite interesting. I, I've never seen a document like that. Uh, maybe you have, but- oh, uh, Me neither. Maybe. Susan, you, have you seen a document like that? Nothing like that, no. No, okay. But the later one is just one sheet of paper, right? With, with, a, with a space for a stamp on, on the top left side. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can find them, you can find those uh, uh, in, in, in George. This is, this is QV period. That's like the uh, King yeah. George V period, right? The later ones were postcards, which size weren't they? Cards. That's right, that's right, that's right. So this is, this is quite interesting. Uh, all right. Anyhow, so oh, this yeah, is a, this is a cover from another member uh, with 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 a, with a, with a circular R cancelling a stamp. Uh, I can't explain why. Uh, nor can he. Maybe uh, it was it was just uh, it's, it's ninety two. is certainly within the B sixty two period. So uh, presumably uh, the, the the clerk. Uh, could have had a rough night and just pick up the wrong cancel and uh, and and then struck it on the stamp. Uh, maybe that's the reason. You see, this is certainly not a registered letter uh, to New York. Um, uh, so so I, I can't I I can't, I can't offer an explanation. Uh, maybe uh, if he if he's here, I think he, I think he might be able to <laughs> explain it to us. You know what happened. Andrew Charles speaking. Ah, yes. That's um, yours, is it? <laughs> well, yes. Okay. And uh, this item uh, 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 was uh, submitted to Royal for opinion. And uh, come back with the certificate is a genuine item. And uh, Patrick Pearson at the moment of time gave a comment saying that it is just accidental use. Yes, yes. Accidental use. Yes. Hey, uh, I uh, remark that it is not it is not a registered mail, uh, but with a pencil mark, uh, a pencil note saying that it is a, a accidental use. Unless unless a stamp uh, uh, somewhere uh, fell off with a B sixty two. See that would be the same as the the, no, the, 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 the Swatow. If you look at the Swatow, right? So unless. You know, it's somewhere. I mean, maybe you could you could take a look with a uh, with a uh, uh, maybe UV or something. Yeah. I've, extend, I've or examined it under UV already. Yeah. And nothing. Uh, nothing. No. 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 No remnant of a stamp. Or... No. No. Therefore, no. Uh, uh, even even Royal will 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 do the the the, the same. Procedure. Oh, they may not. I don't know. They may or may not. Yeah. They 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 they. they I have asked a person. They they did it already. Okay. And, uh, seeing nothing special. Therefore, okay. Okay. So is that accidental? Yeah. The they come to the conclusion that it is uh, just as a dental use. Okay. All right. Okay. So if you are happy with it, since it's your cover, <laughs> going to say okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. Okay. So we we move on to the the, the second query, which is the this is what what we commonly known as the second UPU postage rate. Hong Kong uh, joined the UP on 1st of April, 1877. 
And so by this time, by 1879, uh, April, uh, the, the rates were lowered. So you can see actually this is um, a, a, a copy of the Gazette uh, on the 2nd of April, say 1879, it's actually show two sorts of rates. You see the general rates of postage um, to the country. So the postal union is eight cents per half ounce. And there's some, so the second line is exceptional rates to the country's mark 12 in, in the list below via Brindisi only. So if you look at, if you check out all these, not, a, not every country actually um, needed the 12 cent rate. Um, okay, United Kingdom, yes, the, well, with the 12, i.e. you, you, you pay 12 Luxembourg cents didn't. to go via Brindisi. Uh, but uh, yeah, this is quite interesting that mm. um, the eight cent was reduced from twelve cent, uh, and the, and the twelve cents was reduced from the sixteen cents. Uh, but you see, there's some countries, for example, uh, you know Germany here. We 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 were talking about has no, so you can't is, is, you can't send it via Brindisi. So anyhow, so we look yeah. at that. And then uh, the covers from uh, from a member. Uh, this one is Hong Kong to Hamburg, uh, January eighth, eighteen eighty. It's within the second UPU period, and well, okay, sixteen cents. But this is actually is a double rate, so you can see by the two, uh, there's a red two, uh, nearly trimmed off on on the left side. Um, um, it's by it's by Brindisi uh, here because it was sent by the British packet. So the British packet actually offloaded mail in DC. So uh, <clears throat> it, it's not it's not by uh, by choice of the sender, but you know the the it, it's, uh, the, the British packet went through in DC. So this is not this is not a sixteen cent rate, but uh, but it's an eight cent by two, which is a double eight cent per half ounce rate. So okay, so if you look at that one, this is a Hong Kong to Mu uh, Muhausen. Okay, uh, also the second UPU period uh, by British packet, but this is 12 cents. Right, okay. So, and this also by Brindisi. So what, what, what's going on here? Maybe um, we need an explanation. Maybe the, the Shanghai, Shanghai uh, uh, a guy actually misinterpreted the, uh, the regulation and the one, one the cover, either one cover is overpaid or the other one is underpaid. Anyway, it's got a different type of uh, S1. This, I believe that's type three. And this, uh, I believe is, I don't know, maybe type, type, type four or, or type one. Anyway, so it's interesting. Uh, okay, so. Uh, By the way, Andrew, uh, yes. both covers also uh, with a wood Inception thing that's a rather impressive. Now, the, the interesting thing is, okay, so if, if, if you can actually send, um, <clears throat> send mail uh, to Germany, uh, if it's by French packet, so what happened? Would, would you actually pay eight cent? Because a French packet actually didn't go via Brindisi, it went via Naples and then and to France and then to Germany. See, would that be a would, would, would that be uh, 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 eight cents? And, and this is actually an underpaid. I'm yes, not sure. it's, it's quite yes I think so because because at that moment of time, British packet will use would use a Bindesi wood. Yeah, uh, the Massey wood will only uh, rest upon the 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 the, the, the No, they packet. don't use the Massey Marseille anymore because by that time, the, the French packet would uh, offload at Naples. And then via the railway uh, into France. Okay. And then then via France, then of course you can you can go up to Germany. So that's a, that's a, actually is, is the is the is the French uh, so like a mountain route. So presumably uh, you could actually pay a twelve cent to Germany if it actually went via Brindisi and go straight up. In and and then if you buy French packet. If you went by French packet, you could actually pay eight cent. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm actually, I haven't seen any by French packet and you pay eight cent. So if that's the case, I mean, this cover would be underpaid. The top cover would be underpaid. 
See, one would have thought that UPU is, is the, the postage is pretty mundane, you know, oh, it's either this or that. But now you, you've got the quite interesting situation here, right? Yeah. Okay, well, it's, it's, it's worth thinking about uh, and, and start looking at your, your, your collections, uh, uh, whether, whether you can actually can find, you see both of them are sent by British packet for sure, uh, whether you can actually find some by French packet and pay, pay a different rate. See, according to this table up here, you see, see Germany, nothing, you see. So interesting, anyway. Okay, that's something that I, I, I still need to check it out. Uh, anyway, okay, we move on. Uh, this, uh, some of you may have seen this cover on a certain internet uh, sale. Uh, it's still ongoing. I mean, if you're interested, uh, by all means, you know, <laughs> you can buy it. <laughs> anyway, uh, now I find this quite interesting because the, the seller um, <clears throat> actually did not actually show the back of, of, the, of this uh, uh, folded letter. So I actually uh, asked uh, the, the seller, you know, oh, uh, is there a Hong Kong a CDS on the back of this letter? Because uh, clearly you can see a page at Hong Kong uh, on the front which does not seem to be a fake. Uh, although fakes are known, but this is too pretty. Um, and, um, and you can see, uh, actually this letter, it, uh, it was from San Francisco, and the dateline was from San Francisco, which he didn't show, and which I, I'm gonna show you the back. He finally decided to put the, 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 the letter on the, on the internet uh, to attract buyers anyway. So anyhow, so this letter was actually from San Francisco. Um, and, uh, and you can see there's a one shilling here, uh, which obviously uh, is, is the pay to Hong Kong, it was paid one shilling. And then uh, you can actually see there's a penciled four at the top yeah. right corner, right? We, which could well be uh, some kind of uh, a ship letter rate, maybe from San Francisco to Hong Kong. And then uh, some, maybe some agent uh, paid for the rest of the journey. Uh, obviously not to Batavia. I would say this is the one shilling at that time would be the packet rate, British packet rate, maybe to Singapore and then uh, with a connection from Singapore to uh, 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 Batavia. Um, and you get, yeah, because you can actually see this red box here, which is in the sea brief, which is a, which is a ship letter. Uh, on the franc, this is unpaid uh, mark here. And you can actually some scribble which I don't know. I think I, I think it, I'm I'm not I'm not good at uh, the, uh, the the Dutch, but I think it may be 110, whatever cents or yeah. So anyway, the letter the letter here is actually from San Francisco, uh, dated August 16, 1855. Uh, the letter was about coffee trade. Uh, so this is what I assumed it was carried privately on sailing ship from San Francisco to Hong Kong, uh, and then went into the mail probably to Singapore, and then by private ship to Batavia. There's no Hong Kong back then. It's going across to Hong Kong first. Yeah. Oh, so why, what? The, the question is why no Hong Kong back then? Because obviously uh, somebody paid a shilling in Hong Kong, maybe it was missed out, I don't know. So it's worth uh, thinking uh, about. <laughs> It's a fake. And maybe it's a fake. <laughs> yes, you're right. I, I, I've, been, I've been thinking that is, is the paid in Hong Kong fake? Uh, doesn't look like it. I mean, it looks pretty good. Uh, you know, especially, uh, you know, the, the small crown paid. I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, they, they, they're, 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 yeah, there is a, a fake paid in Hong Kong mark uh, on a lot of uh, the, the Indian, the, uh, opium letters, but uh, you think this is, looks too good. To, too good. Anyway, I'm I'm not sure why why there was no maybe they missed up the the, the back stamp or maybe there was a pile of letters and uh, it was just not struck on the back. So that was a pity. Andrew, yes. Andrew, the last time that the the I my bad memory said that the forgery of that cancel was slightly smaller in size. Yeah, you're right, you're right. So, you know, yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you can buy it, Sam, and, and check it out. <laughs> <laughs> it's not enough, it's, it's not, the price is quite reasonable. 
I mean, I'm sure that with the, with the, with the uh, with the Hong Kong date stamp on the back, I mean, it would have been sold a long time ago. That's how <laughs> anyway, a anyway, yeah, that, so, that's uh, how a forger gets you. <laughs> it's too good to be true. Yeah, too, yeah, too good, good to, to be, be true. true. You're right. <laughs> anyway, uh, okay, we move on, shall we? Uh, into the next item. Ah, this is this is. Um, I, I think uh, uh, Susan's item. Uh, I think uh, Susan. It is, yes. Yeah, yeah. I believe you, you sent it to me and asking for an explanation. And I say, wow, I mean, Susan, you pick up a bargain. Uh, so, so, anyway, uh, so this is a, a one cent, a four cent gray postcard overprinted one cent for local use. And uh, it has a five cent uh, hand stamp on cans as, as a cancel on the uh, indicium. Uh, here, with the five cents actually is the same as this one, uh, which was the, almost it, it was it was actually used around uh, 1880, and um, and this one is actually is is, is a postage stew hand stamp. Uh, this is actually Proud's recorded date, um, uh, probably, and this one the, the letter original letter that he described was was probably from a China China coastal town, maybe Fuchao, Amoy, or Swatow. Uh, because the, the SS Swatow is it's uh, I can't remember it's, it's a ship uh, it's a it's a it's a chartered um, ship by uh, uh, some, some firm uh, which uh, uh, traveled between uh, Fu Chao Amoya Swatow and Hong Kong uh, uh, you know up and down the coast uh, it was it was originally sent as unpaid and charged on arrival without postage due. Uh, five cent was the in, interpot rate at the time. So uh, why was the five cent there? Uh, well, I mean, you have your 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 theory. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's the same as the the circular R on on the stamp. Yeah, you know, it was uh, it was on a, a rough night. <laughs> the person pick up the wrong job, thinking it's P sixty two, and 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 then and then uh, and then bang bang it goes anyway. You got, you is, got your theory, uh, uh, Susan? There is another example yes, that's that? earlier than this. In, yes, yes. Oh, okay. A March 1, 81. All right. To the same Basel mission. It's another okay. one, four cents card. And it's illustrated by Lee Scamp. All right. Um, if you look in his paper on Postal Stationery, it's illustrated and he gives you um, uh -huh. A website to go to, and there's an exhibit of postal stationery. Yes, and yes. the examples there. Okay, cancel them exactly the same way. Exactly the same way. Ah, right. Okay, so it, it, it may not be uh, uh, accidental. Okay, oh, I mean, it's, it's worth thinking about. Uh, yeah. So I think you know that that's all I have uh, uh, time for um, this evening. Um, so any, any questions, any, anybody got any questions on these few items? Andrew, can I see the Armoy one with the, with the R again? The Armoy one with the R. Oh, yeah. This one? No. That, that AR card. You mean? Oh, the AR card, yeah, this one. Yes. Quite nice one. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. Thank you. Right. Okay. Um, so anyway, mm -hmm. uh, so that that's that's all. That's that's my uh, share. Uh, so if anybody got any comments, uh, you you can let 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 me know, or you can voice out. Okay, right, so I can stop sharing. Good. Uh, right, uh, anybody got anything uh, to say or anybody want to share? Um, as editor, I'm in, I'm in trouble the next one. At the moment, I've only got seven pages. So if anybody has anything on a guy's oh. mask. When's it due? Um, when, when is the next journal due? It's it's July. Oh, July. Okay. All right. Another two weeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You only got seven pages. 
Yeah, mm. I think I overdid. Um, there's probably something from from Richard in the. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we took, we took and white 20 pages. <laughs> anyway, no, I, I, I might give something to you. Onigashimasu. Yes. That's um, Japanese for yes, please. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm sure Charles got something to, 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 to contribute as well. Huh? You always have something to contribute. I'm always sure of something to push it, okay? Yeah, yeah. And Harman, Harman's got loads of stuff to share. He can help you out. On which subject? <laughs> which subject? Anything. Anything. Oh. I mean, you can do a QA on the on the journal. The alternative is we have a thin number. The last two have been pretty mm. pretty hefty, hefty comparatively. Yes. Oh, by the way, uh, I think as, as Sam actually showed, uh, showed me today by email that uh, the last journal uh, has, a, has a postage due mark on. <laughs> I don't know whether you, you, you guys, uh, maybe from the UK or, or US, arrived, yeah. got the same treatment. No. I think it was, it was about, no. mm -hmm. about 20 cents over uh, underpaid. It's a bit mean at the post office. It was sent by surface. If this is 401, I haven't received mine yet. You haven't received yours yet. How come? Yeah. How come Sam's got his it's, it's in Canada? Took two months. The latest what? I've got is January. Oh, 400. Huh? Is that the next 401 we're talking about, aren't we? 401. Yeah, 401. 401 yeah. I, I haven't seen Hannah Hyde of 401. Oh, right. Well, it, it doesn't matter because in Canada, there's no postage due system, period. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. whatever they <laughs> do, <laughs> right. you know, it's right, too right. expensive to, for Canada Post to hire people mm. to tackle this. So forget it. You mm. can send it anything and it would be delivered. Nobody collects money. <laughs> <laughs> you could be getting some strange mail, Sam. <laughs> yes. From now on, you know, create philatelic gems. So, you know, that that's why I, I was... I was questioning where, you know, uh, too bad that Engel was not here, everybody, because, uh, hey, what about the other ones? Is it just this one? I mean, yeah. they actually make a label. Yeah. They put it on a label and stuck it on. You know how how difficult it is yeah. you know, to put this on, you know, so, so somebody attempted to collect the 20 cents. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how they work out, work it out, but I think it's a special label they made up because it was exactly yeah. twenty cents um, underpaid. Yeah, exactly twenty over. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I guess there is no return label mm. that they could ship this back and ask for it in Hong Kong, right? No, no. Andrew. No, there's no address. You see, it, it, no maybe, address. maybe Nick will get get a letter from the GPO. <laughs> <laughs> Asking this payment. Yeah. Right. <laughs> because it's got Nick address on the left. Yeah. <laughs> no. if, if it's the Japanese post office would charge, would get that money from me. Yeah, he would they would. That's why that's why yours has been detained. You get a, you get a, you get a call from Jap Japan Post asking you to go and pay uh, whatever, you know, it's of uh, 50 yen or something. They actually sent a postcard. Oh which I have to apply stamps to, to the value of what's due and send it back to them. And then my items delivered. Yeah. That's so the, that's labor the intensive. <laughs> uh, sorry, Andrew. Yeah. Uh, the news, uh, you said the newsletter sending uh, uh, printed matter weight? No, there's no printed matter weight. Okay, letter weight, okay. Yeah, it's just letter weight, no printed matter weight anymore. Okay. So that's why it makes it quite because I'm thinking because uh, I'm thinking about uh, in the old days the pin the matter will yes. not return, therefore it will be undelivered, will be destroyed. Uh, yeah, so yeah. No, they stop. They stop the print the matter rate. Uh, I think maybe five, six, six, seven years ago. Okay. Therefore, it used to be a second class rate, but they stopped it. So it's so that's why it's quite expensive to to. Yeah, to it's sell. the same in the UK as well. Huh? Okay. I said the UK is the same. There's no printed paper yeah. anymore. Have you got yours, by the way, Duncan? No. Ah, okay. Right. But we, 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 if it's coming surface, it's 
any of them for three to six months at present. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I just wonder why it's so quick to to Canada. I mean, certainly it's not by air mail. Because well, no probably, perhaps mail. they did. Huh? We just perhaps lucky. they did. Mm. Yeah. It's just lucky. Oh, you're very lucky. I've never not, I've never seen that label before. They made it up you specially need, for you because I mean, you who, need, who, you who, need. Did, you know, who who wished Royal to get the post office twenty cents? <laughs> I, I did. I just didn't bother to to stick the twenty cents on because <laughs> you mean two more stamps, you know. <laughs> Anyhow, okay. Well, that that's the fun. Anyway, um, well, thank you very much for. Um, if there's no further uh, 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 snippets or things, uh, thank you very much for joining the meeting, and um, I look forward to see you next month uh, in July. Um, and uh, let, let's see what we're going to talk about. We're going to have another show or tell, or maybe another member wishes to do a, a solo uh, presentation. So uh, for me, it's a uh, good evening to our, our friends in, uh, in Japan and, um, and uh, Hong Kong, and there's good afternoon to uh, <laughs> Susan and Duncan, and, uh, and, uh, and a good, good Good, good morning <laughs> from, from our friends, uh, from Sam and Harmon in, in, the, in the States and Canada. Okay, so see you next Thank time. You, and bye-bye. Uh, bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.